me just tell you that, you know, Hete is a preacher by profession, so that was amazing restraint. Uh, <laughs> For that, so you, that, that's just, that was amazing uh, that he could hold himself in like that. Um, but it, uh, we got to hear much at our Amon prayer meeting on Wednesday mornings, heard a much uh, longer uh, version of that. And I'll tell you, just to hear him talk about what he did uh, is exhausting. Uh, so I can't really imagine uh, having done it uh, like he did. Mark chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Mark chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Let's stand together and we'll read those three verses. And as he reclined at table in his house, that's probably Levi's house. It's a little disputed uh, among scholars, but probably Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, you have shown favor to your people. Lord, you have shown favor in Mongolia by raising up a people beginning about 30 years ago in a rapid way. And uh, Father, we just thank you for the report on what is going on there now where there are many churches where just a little over 35 years ago there were none. And where there are church planning efforts going on to spread, to regain the ground that has been lost through government lockdown and government opposition. And we do pray for the leadership, for the church in Mongolia, and for the efforts of the Among Foundation, in particular, as they seek to make that effort and to see that fruit and the expansion and the health and the strength of the church in that place. And Father, you have shown favor to the church in the United States in many ways as well. And we pray that as in Mongolia, so here you would restore the fortunes of your people. And Lord, as we as a congregation think about our efforts and our thoughts in this community and consider the possibility of making a church planning effort part of that, we pray for your wisdom, your guidance, unity, direction in all of this. Lord, you have shown favor to your people. And we pray that you would restore the fortunes of your people in this country as well as around the world. Lord, you have forgiven the iniquities of your people. You have covered all of our sins. You've turned your anger away from your people, your hot anger. And we pray that you would restore us in the power of your salvation. You would turn away your disappointment and your indignation with your people, for we are disappointing people. We are often a half-hearted people. We are very often a tremendously inconsistent people. 
And so, Lord, we ask that you would indeed, as the psalmist says in Psalm 85, restore the fortunes of your people. Lord, your loving kindness and your faithfulness, may you gather them together upon us and in us and through us. May righteousness and peace meet together among your people. May truth, like plants from the ground, sprout up within your church and through the church within our country. And may you look down with the thought of blessing our efforts. So, Lord, we just pray that you would come as our covenant God and do good things in our midst, that you would produce fruitfulness through us as your people in all of our various walks of life, wherever those walks of life bring us, and however difficult those walks of life may become, as they are exceedingly difficult for some in our midst through disease, through relational disruption, through financial pressures. Lord, we often face many trials and many tribulations, but we face none of them apart from you. Lord, cause us to walk before you in righteousness. And we pray, Father, that you would guide the footsteps of our feet to be followers of yours. And we ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. It was Robert Redford's first film as a director starred something of an all-star cast of that day. It's quite a while ago now. Donald Sutherland, Mary Tyler Moore, Timothy Hutton, nominated for six Academy Awards, the film was. Not all that much recommending it. Some of you probably saw it. it came on the scene 42 years ago, was excessively depressing. Uh, but has this, had this uh, intriguing and really pretty insightful title, Ordinary People. Ordinary People. About a suburban family in the Chicago area that would have looked quite prosperous and quite average and fairly normal, but if you looked just beneath the surface, all kinds of angst, all kinds of trouble, all kinds of disruption, all kinds of heartache, and more than that, all kinds of deep, penetrating, painful flaws, which the entire story uh, was built around. Now at the heart of our present text is the fact that Jesus ends up looking pretty comfortable sitting in the company of Robert Redford's ordinary people. Summarized in Mark as tax gatherers and sinners. In first century language, that little of tax gatherers and sinners, you know, would, would, would strike you a little bit more like not too long ago in our own political discourse, right? So Jesus is gathered together with this basket of deplorables. Uh, that's how it looks to the Pharisees. You're hanging out with this basket of deplorables. And it's ironic. 
uh, and supposed to be experienced by, as ironic that the Pharisees are quite sure uh, that they are not among those in the basket, that they're a completely different kind of people. But Mark's point, of course, is that in one sense, they are a different kind of people, but not in the sense that they think. But in the more tragic sense that they're deplorable in a way they don't perceive. Where the people that Jesus is dealing with and helping and who, as we have seen, are beginning to follow him. It was precisely their sense of their own sinfulness, their own deplorableness that led them after Jesus. Here's how Mark puts it, and then we'll, I'll give you the uh, parallel over in Luke, who adds one little phrase at the end that is supposed to be assumed in Mark, but Luke makes it explicit. And as he reclined at table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax gatherers and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners. Luke writes of it this way. And Levi made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax gatherers and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, and Luke adds, to repentance. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, to repentance. Ordinary people. At their best, they're not very impressed with themselves at their best, often thrust upon them by life itself, is a sense of lostness, the need of help, the need of wisdom, the need of forgiveness, which is what leads this large group of people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. State our thesis for this morning this way, the people of God do not tend to be made up of society's all-star team. Never have. They never will. The people of God do not tend to be made up of society's all star team. Oh, there's plenty of prominent Christians, don't get me wrong, but they're never the main bulk. They're never the central group. That group tends to be much less impressive. In fact, that group tends to be far from impressive. Three observations from Mark's little account. Number one, Jesus is followed by a surprising group of people. At least it was a surprise to the scribes of the Pharisees. Um, and maybe a bit of a surprise to us as well. Jesus is followed by a surprising group 
of people. And as he reclined at table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Not just Levi, a whole bunch of Levi-like people are, are following Jesus. Tax collectors in, uh, in the first century uh, in, in Israel were thought of this way. So these are Jewish tax collectors like Levi. So these are Jewish people who are cooperating with the Roman Empire oppressors and not only cooperating, but officially cooperating. And in many cases, as part of their official cooperation, they learn to despise their own people in a similar way that the Roman Empire despises the Jewish people. And so they become increasingly comfortable with overcharging taxes, riching, uh, ripping people off, and, and this whole kind of thinking. That's the stereotypical pop idea in the first century of the tax collector. It's a compromising Jewish person who's crossed the line, cooperating with the culture, with the Roman Empire, and not only doing that, but actually taking advantage of their own people because of the privilege granted them by the empire. That's an unpopular thing to have said about you. Uh, and that's who Levi was. And remember, that's precisely what Levi, where Levi was when Jesus came and called him. He's sitting right in the tax booth. Right where that kind of thing was carried out and carried off. And now we read that there are many, many uh, like Levi who have followed after Jesus in the same way. For as in our day, as in every day, the bulk of Jews in the first century were pretty loosely connected to Judaism. I've mentioned many times uh, northern Chicago where uh, Shirley and I lived right after uh, we were married, um, largely a Roman Catholic community, uh, uh, but a very typical sort of uh, Roman Catholic would have been. My, the lead man at our factory, a guy named Wally, was 62 years old at the time, coming near the end of his career in that place. And, uh, and, and Wally was, um, he was lewd uh, often. Um, his language was regularly horrific. Um, his, his attitude tended to be uh, arrogant and condescending to those uh, younger and making their way into the factory where he had been for, for, for many years. Uh, but he, uh, he let somebody like me know right away that he was Roman Catholic because he took me to be uh, an overly religious sword. And so lest you think that you need to have a religious conversation with me, let me tell you, I'm already covered. You know, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. That was Wally. Well, let me tell you something. That's the bulk. That's the bulk. When, when, when you read that Americans are, are X amount Christian, more of that number is closer to Wally than they are to Billy Graham. Uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And that's not only a, a Christian thing, that was a Jewish thing in the first century as well. This group of people, this basket of deplorables, this is the mainstream of first century Judaism. Uh, half of it's covered by the, the narrower picture, tax gatherers. The secondary description, which we didn't touch on, is sinners. That's this group. That's what, that's what Mark means by sinners when he puts it in the mouth of the 
Pharisees, the sinners, oh, they're all officially Jewish, but they pay no attention to Jewish priorities, by and large. They certainly pay no attention to the law. In fact, one of the translators, in trying to bring that out, it's, it's not much of a translation other than it's, it's an accurate understanding, just translate this as non-observant Jews. Uh, tax gatherers and non-observant Jews. See, That would be like tax gatherers and, and non-observant Christians. We're officially Christian, but we don't really do anything Christian. We don't think in Christian ways. We don't talk in Christian ways. We don't have Christian priorities uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But there were many of them following. And that's the bulk of the church always. Uh, and I mean now the faithful church. They've come out of something like that. That's where we all come from. That's where we all start. It's, it's never the story of the Christian that I was a nice person that Jesus helped make slightly nicer. Um, now, sometimes we think of ourselves that way, talk of ourselves that way, which makes you wonder whether we're even who we think we are. Because anybody with any spiritual understanding knows I wasn't a nice person that I needed Jesus to help me make me just a little nicer. No, no. I was always one of the ordinary people, the messed up people, the wrecked people, the twisted people. That's who I was. Paul himself, a former Pharisee, remember how he put it in writing to the Corinthians as he talked about who they were, where they came from. Uh, now we've moved from Palestine over into uh, uh, Asia, but here's how, here's how he put it to them. And Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring about the things that are. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 28. He says, consider your calling, brothers. Considering where you were when, when Jesus analogously speaking, came by and called you, considered your calling, like he called Levi, like he called these friends of Levi's and these associates that are all gathered there, these ordinary people. And they reclined at the table in his house, many tax gatherers and sinners for reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many like that who followed him. Flawed, ordinary people. Secondly, Jesus is faulted uh, for the nature of his followers. I don't know if you noticed when I read the Mark's account and Luke's account, this is another little nuanced difference between them. In Mark's account, it's almost exclusively Jesus who was faulted for the nature of these people. In Luke's account, it's the disciples as a whole. Why do you guys hang out with this group of people? In Mark, it's why does your master hang out with these people? Verse 16, And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors? And sinners. Why does Jesus do the thing that he does? And the thing that he does is eat with tax collectors and sinners. Now, the scribes of the Pharisees, this would be the more academic, Bible oriented piece of the Pharisaic movement. Not everybody in the Pharisaic movement is a scribe. 
Not everybody is a Bible student. Not everybody is scholarly-like. But this particular group, that's who this is. These, this is the scribes of the Pharisees. Uh, this is the more academic piece of the Pharisaic movement who would know uh, quite a bit about what is written down in the text of Scripture, and we'll come back to that in, in, in just a moment. Uh, and there's some things that uh, are written down in Scripture that would certainly seem to make their, their point. But the Pharisees, you see, are a very, very, they're, very, they're the conservative movement of first century Judaism. Between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, definitely the Pharisees are the conservatives. So this would be the scholarly element of the conservative movement. Raising this question, are the Pharisees more conservative than Jesus? Are the Pharisees more conservative than Jesus? They certainly assume they are. But the question is, are they actually, does Mark understand us? Is he, is he trying to convince us? Well, see, the Pharisees were overly conservative because the Pharisees are more conservative than Jesus. Are they? Are the Pharisees more conservative than Jesus? We looked at this last week in a side text, and I'll just read the text again, which puts this center stage. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Some of you listened to the little briefing that Al Mohler, president of Southern Seminary, gives five days a week most of the year. He's just called the briefing, interacts with major news articles. And, uh, and very often, several times, several times a month, uh, he will pause to make this little comment about the nature of what it means to call yourself a conservative. Say conservatives conserve. The very nature of a conservative is that they conserve. They conserve tradition, they conserve history, they conserve. They're, they're not super prone to change. Here's how it's put in Webster's Dictionary. Uh, Conservatism is the disposition to preserve what is established. Opposition to innovation and change. But the first one is the one that relates so well to Jesus. The disposition to preserve what is established. Do you see how conservative Jesus is when it comes to the law? Nothing changes. Nothing changes. Not pieces of the letters that make up the words that make up the sentences in the law. That's the whole dot tittle thing. Pieces of grammatical niceties that you'd see in a Hebrew sentence. Those don't change. Nothing changes. Now, I mention that to say it is impossible to be more conservative than Jesus. Can't be done. He embraces the Word of God as written in a fixed, unmovable 
sense. Well, then, what, what is going on with he and the scribes and the Pharisees? Oh, just this. See, Jesus' conservatism did not make him a separatist. Jesus' conservatism does not make him a separatist. Pharisaical conservatives makes them, they, they are separatists. They're separatistic in their thinking, they're separatistic in their actions. Jesus, not so. Not so. He moves in, slides along all manners of different kinds of people. And, and, that, and that's where he is. But he's, he's absolutely unmovable. So tonight, tonight in the evening service, Don will be on Exodus 16. Jesus would never back away from anything in Exodus 16. Not a word, not a piece of a letter, nothing. It's all fixed, all certain. That's Jesus' view of things. That's his understanding of things. Absolutely immovable from that. Want to know how Jesus thinks? Just read the Old Testament. That's exactly how he thinks. That's how he thinks. Won't move off of anything found there. Now, having said that, there's things in there that would seem to give a little credence to the Pharisees' concern. Paul, as a formal Pharisee, shares one of these in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33. In 15.33, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. Just yesterday, the devo- I'm a ways out in our Saturday devotionals, but so the, I wrote a devotional yesterday on Psalm 119, verse 115, which is exactly the same sort of point. You stay away, from, look out, look out for the wicked. You know, keep me from the wicked that I may that I may keep your word. Keep me from the wicked. Well, Pharisees, could, what? Look at that! Look at that, Jesus. So what would Jesus' response be? Well, of course, Jesus would say, you, you don't want to let wicked people move you, but you do need to try to move them. Remember how Mark's gospel opened, pretty much. Uh, we, we, we noted it, Mark 1, 17, Now, the translation sounds like he's using the same verb that he does here. That's not really true. He doesn't use the main verb for follow, but it's translated in English because it's a synonymous idea for sure. Uh, Mark 1.17, follow me and I will make you to be fishers of men. Had the disciples been quick on their feet, why does your... Master, gather with tax gatherers and sinners. Oh, because we're a fishers of men movement. That's why. It's a dangerous business because the the world and the wicked will try to shape you, and they're often successful. So it's don't underestimate it. What the what the Pharisees are worried about is a real thing. It's a real thing. It's a genuine danger. It's something that the law of God itself tells you you better keep in mind. Hence, Psalm 119, verse 115. On the other hand, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to him, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And the answer is, because they are such of a deeply spiritually needy people. And following Jesus means that we follow him into relationships with people who are deeply needy. Um, 
But see the, the big difference between the, the conservatism of the Pharisees and the conservatism of Jesus is the conservatism of the Pharisees is separatist. And the conservatism of Jesus is immersing, non-separatist, confronting, rubbing shoulders side by side with the neediest people there are. Thirdly, finally, Jesus is focused on those with real or felt need. Verse 17, when Jesus heard it, namely the grumbling of the scribes of the Pharisees, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, verse 17 is dripping with irony, and if you don't feel that, you're not reading it right. See, Jesus is not paying them a compliment here. Oh, he's, he's not saying this. Oh, I see your problem. Yes, I came into the world. You know, no, this is what you don't get. I came into the world for flawed people. Now, of course, there's many non-flawed people in the world. There's many just wonderful souls like you uh, wandering and out. No need for my visit. If everybody was like you, no need for my visit. No need for forgiveness. If everybody was like you, everything would be wonderful. No, no, I didn't come for, for you because you're all together. You've got it all together. Anybody can see that. Everybody knows that. Well, that is what he's saying, but he's dripping with sarcasm as he says it. No, I didn't come to reach people like you who have it all together. No, as we've already described it, nice people looking for a couple of tips that might even make them nicer if possible, but it would be hard to believe because you're already so nice. No, right? You're already so righteous. How could you get nicer than that? Don't really know. But maybe, maybe Jesus could help. He says that very sarcastically. Very sarcastically. They feel that they are good to go. Now this is the importance of what Russ read from John chapter 3 earlier. Uh, looking again, we've talked about this before and we'll talk about it again. This is really important to see. Sometimes we don't, we don't see it, right? Because it's, th this, is, this is the textual house right next door to John 3.16. And so we tend to keep our eyes so much on John 3.16 that we drive by the next house without even seeing it, uh, the next verse. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But then John 3.17 says this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So here's the question. What does it mean? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. What does that mean? That means... There was no need for Jesus to come into the world if God wanted to condemn the world because it was already condemned before he got there. It's already condemned, the whole thing, Pharisees and all. It's all completely condemned, completely hopeless. No need, if you wanted to condemn the world, no need to, to send Jesus. It's already done. They're all set to go. No, the only reason that you send Jesus is in order that the world might be saved through him. 
the previously already condemned world might be saved through him. Paul's point, you remember, in Romans 3 is to say to his, especially the conservative Jewish element that he himself came out of, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, Jews, Gentiles, everybody. Gentiles, Jews, non-observant Jews, Pharisaical Jews, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and the blessed thing you see about these, this basket of deplorables is they have a sense of that. And many others in the society have no sense of that. Ironically, we live in a culture where about the only sin left is the sin of Pharisaism, culturally speaking. There are no sins. Nobody's a sinner. You say, yeah, that ticks me off. It ticks me off. That's why I don't, that's why I don't listen to that liberal news media. But you ever think about that phenomenon from a spiritual point of view? How deadly is it to live in a society where you have a serious problem with sin and nobody but nobody is officially allowed to tell you? No movie will hint at that to you. In fact, quite the opposite. No, 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 no. There is no such thing. Nothing you read in the paper hint in that direction. No. No, there's there's no such thing. Nothing hints in that direction. In fact, to cause somebody to call, to even hint that somebody might be a sinner now is to harm them. And you're the problem. Quit harming people. Quit walking around harming people. The only message you can say, no, everybody's okay. Now that's helpful. Everybody's okay. Unless the world is actually under condemnation. Which is what it is. Our culture likes to take a story like this and and bend it in the direction, well, see, Jesus... If only the rest of the church was more like Jesus. See, he, doesn't, he doesn't judge anybody. He doesn't condemn anybody. He doesn't criticize anybody. He just sits down and has a nice meal with them. Well, I mean, you know, we say many times context is king. Well, in, in the context of the New Testament, frankly, that's obviously nonsense. But as we noted, in a text like this, when you go over to Luke's parallel, um, uh, you find it stated really, really, really plainly and, uh, and simply and straightforwardly, right? I mean, because uh, Luke just adds on to the end of uh, what we have in verse um, 17. Uh, Luke just adds this. Jesus, having heard, he said to them, those being strong don't have need of a physician, but those having illness, those having sickness. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. And Luke simply adds, to repentance. To repentance. To change place their feet in line with the will and way of God. And that's our calling. 
That's what it means to be disciples. That's what it means to be followers. We walk in the footsteps of Jesus. But the footsteps of Jesus will will lead us into many messy lives. And that's good. That's right. Other pieces of law, be careful out there, but Jesus is more conservative than the Pharisees. He's more conservative than the Pharisees. But they're separatists. He's not. He's not. Don't be a separatist. Don't be a Pharisee. Walk with the Lord Jesus, but notice where he goes. Notice where he ends up. Notice who he influences. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your gospel words to us. We thank you for giving us access to the will and ways of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the ultimate expression of your will and way. Lord, shape us by the will and way of Jesus.